In the family, everyone has a role to play. Think for a minute about your family and what role each member may play. There's the person that gets everything together, the facilitator, the organized one, the creative one, the one that initiates everything, the talker, hi everybody, the analyst, the risk taker, the one that works behind the scenes, the leader, the follower, the photographer, the cook, the doer, the planner, me again, the caregiver, the protector, the peacemaker, the one that keeps everything and the one get, that gets rid of all the clutter, the storyteller, the one that makes everyone laugh, the serious one, the realist, the dreamer, the pessimist, the optimist, the morning person, the night owl, and so on and so on. Initially, some of these roles may seem a little bit annoying or maybe less important to you. But if you really think about it, you love everyone and you need every member to bring balance to the family. You may wish that you could be the funny one or you might wish that the dreamer might come back down to earth for a little while or that the planner would just leave everybody alone a little bit. But you actually know that a good listener is also needed that the realist needs some hope and excitement once in a while, that if it were left to the follower, then nobody would ever get together, right? Every person in the family is needed. And it's the same with the family of God. We all have a part to play. And we all have to work together to accomplish God's will. And so today, we're going to read about some people who don't like their role and they're trying to take over the role of another. They feel like their role isn't important enough and that they're a little more capable of performing the role that they consider a little more important than the person that God selected to do it. So let's read number 16 and see how God referees this sibling rivalry. Beginning in verse 1 all the way to verse 11. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Iliad, and On, the son of Peleth, the sons of Reuben. These all took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and they said to them, You take too much upon yourself. All the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among us all. So why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard this, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all his company, and he said, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show you who is his and who is holy, and he will cause him to come near to him. The one that the Lord chooses, he will cause to come near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah, and all of your company, and put fire in them, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it'll be that the man that the Lord chooses, he is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation and serve them? And that he's brought you near to himself, you and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you? Are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? So... It's annoying to read all of these names, right? It's like the son of, the son of, the son of. But that was important because it was explaining that Korah is from the tribe of Levi. And the Kohathites specifically had already been chosen by God to serve him with regard to the holy things in the sanctuary. And so Moses was saying, is this not enough honor for you? Korah didn't realize that what had separated Moses and Aaron from the rest of the Levites or the rest of the congregation, for that matter, was God. His argument was that all of Israel had been set apart by the Lord 
And Moses and Aaron had elevated themselves to a position that God had not. Basically, they were saying, you're nothing special and you shouldn't be treated like that. And so this just brought to my mind, have we ever felt like this before? Have we ever looked at somebody and wondered, why are they so special? I'm God's child too. I'm the same as them. What makes them so special that they place themselves above me? And then it's like, eh, maybe like Cora, I'm thinking about this all wrong. Maybe they aren't above me at all, but they're just in a different role. You see, Aaron had a role and Cora had a different role. They were both from the tribes of Levi, but God had chosen them to do something different. The tribe of Levi had been separated to God to serve them, but they each were serving in a different way. Both important in what they did, just different. And so although Cora was right that God had chosen Aaron to be a little nearer to him than the other Israelites, and definitely uh, more than the rest of the people. But that's God's right. He created each one of us with specific gifts. And the purpose that he has for us is different depending on those gifts and our individual circumstances. And so we need to respect where God has placed each person and just do our job well. The way God set it up, it takes everybody working together to accomplish his will. And so God explains this to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 12. And you can read all of it in its full context if you want to, but I'm just going to read um, parts of this chapter beginning in verse 4. It says, There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences in ministry, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And then in verse 8, it tells the different ways that the Spirit manifests itself in different people. And it says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and yet another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. And then skip 13 and go down to 14, and it says, For in fact, the body isn't one member, but many different members. If the foot should say, Because I'm not a hand, then I'm not of the body, is it therefore really not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body was an eye, then where would the hearing be? And if the whole body was hearing, then where would the smelling be? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleases. And if they were all one member, then where would the whole body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And then the following verses talk about the importance of body parts and <clears throat> that we may see some body parts as less significant and how one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. And then in verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. So these are the members of the church. The apostles, second, the prophets, third, teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all prophets, are all apostles, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? 
Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But you earnestly desire the best gifts, yet I show you a more excellent way. And then one more verse in Romans 12, 3 through 8, Paul describes this exact thing to the Romans. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought, but think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If our gift is of prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, then let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives, giving with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy, doing it with cheerfulness. So the point is that we all have different gifts that hold different purposes. And we don't need to be jealous of other people's gifts, thinking that our gifts are useless in comparison to theirs, or thinking that our purpose is more important than theirs and that they're useless to us. Every role and every purpose is important for the whole to function well. God created us to need each other and to work together. And so we have to be very careful about acting like these people that are rebelling against Aaron and Moses, not being satisfied with our own role and trying to play a role that God never intended us to play or trying to take away a role that God intended for someone else. That's what we can learn from what Korah and all of his people are doing. And so instead of trying to prove himself to the people, Moses just told them, he said, hey, put some oil in your censers and then all of us can come before God and God can judge between us who he's chosen to be the leader. And so let's continue reading in this passage beginning in verse 12 to verse 15. So Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we're not going to come. Is it a small thing that you've brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should just keep acting like your prince over us? Moreover, you haven't even brought us into the land flowing with milk and honey or given us the inheritance of the fields and the vineyards. Will you now put out the eyes of all these men? We're not going to come up. And then Moses was very angry and he said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt them in any way. Now, we talked earlier about Kohath, but Abiram and Dathan, they were from the tribe of Reuben. And Reuben was the firstborn son of Israel. And these sons had joined Korah in this rebellion. And here they're blaming Moses for not taking him into the promised land, even though he had nothing to do with it and he had tried to get them to enter. They took no responsibility for their resistance and they acted as if Moses had failed them as a leader because he didn't do what he said he would when he brought them out of Egypt. And so they also resisted him as their perpetual leader and stood against him. And so Moses, on the other hand, he's angry at his accusers. And he asks God, he says, judge between us. And then he pleads his case to God and he says, I haven't done anything wrong towards them. Now, notice that Moses was confident and he was willing to publicly stand up for his actions because he knew he had done nothing wrong. And so a couple of things here before we move on. First, we need to be careful not to blame other people for our sins like these men were. It's not Moses' fault that they weren't entering the promised land. It was theirs. And so their blame was completely misplaced. Also, when we face opposition from someone like Moses did, we can also go to God and ask God to judge between who is right and who is wrong and make it clear to everybody. King Solomon prayed exactly like this when he built the temple. And so uh, let's read his prayer right now. It's in 1 Kings eight thirty to 32. And he says, God, may you hear the supplication of your servant and your people Israel when they pray towards this place, this temple that he just built. 
Here in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. When anyone sins against his neighbor and then is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, then hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the wicked one and bringing his way on his head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his righteousness. Now, for us, it'd probably be wise to genuinely ask God if we're the ones that are in the wrong before we declare our innocence and another person's guilt to the world. Um, But Moses was confident that he had been following God, and so he is doing this publicly. Now, another prayer that we can pray in order to know if we're doing what God wants us to is found in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. And it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way that's everlasting. So he's saying, God, show me. And then in Jeremiah 10, 23 and 24, it says, O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in the man who walks to direct his own steps. O Lord, correct me, but correct me with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. And so he's saying, you know, we want correction if we're the ones wrong, but we need God to be gentle with us because we're just human and we don't always do everything right. And that's a comfort to me that I can say, God, you know, show me where I'm going wrong, but please be gentle with me because I know that I probably deserve much harsher correction, but I I might not be able to take it. And so... It might be that God tells us that we're the one in the wrong. And if that's the case, then we need to go and make it right with the other person. But if God doesn't reveal to us any wrongdoing, then we can ask him for justice. And this might come in the form of revelation and repentance on the part of the one that's accusing us. Or it might come in the form of God's action against that person as it does end up happening for Moses. We need God's gentleness to deal with us and only he knows if gentle correction is going to work for the other person, if it's going to bring about the desired result. Now, listen to what it says in Jeremiah 20, 11 and 12. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and they will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous and see the mind and heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for I have pleaded my cause before you. And so that's what basically Moses is doing. He says, you know, I haven't done anything wrong, and I need you to judge between us and show these people that they are the ones that are wrong. So let's keep reading and see how God reveals his choice, beginning in verse 16. Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Let each of you take a censer and put incense in it, and each of you may bring your censer before the Lord, 250 censers, both you and Aaron with his censer. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense in it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that they may be consumed in a moment. Then they fell on their faces and they said, O God, the God of spirits of all flesh, Shall one man sin and you be angry with the whole congregation? And so Korah, the 250 elders, and Aaron all stood before the Lord with their censers. But Korah had gathered the whole congregation against uh, Moses and Aaron. And this made God just want to kill all of them. But Moses again pled for God's mercy for those that had been led astray by these rebellious people. Moses knew that the real fault was with their leaders and that the people were just weak and they were easily led astray. And he also knew that God knows the hearts of each person and the weakness of the flesh. And so he asked God to only punish the instigators. And so that made me wonder, 
could I do that? Am I able to discern between those that have evil intentions and then those are that are just following the crowd and making a mistake? There are those that are just too weak to do the right thing. And they don't deserve our condemnation and anger in the same way that those that have evil intentions. And so Moses was able to say, you know, Everybody doesn't have even evil intentions. Some of them are just too weak. They don't understand and they're following the wrong people. And so it can be hard for us to distinguish, first of all, between those two types of people and then to want to have mercy on people whenever they're condemning you, especially in public. And so here's a couple of verses if this is something that you struggle with. Romans 15, 1 and 2 says, we then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please our neighbor for his good, leading to edification. And then Ephesians four thirty one and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's the thing, right? God forgives us, so we should be forgiving and kind and tenderhearted to others. 1 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. We exhort you, brothers, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good both for yourselves and for everyone else. And that's what Moses was doing, right? 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. In humility, correct those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snares of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Correct those that are in opposition with humility, hoping that God will grant them repentance, that they'll come to understand the truth and, and they'll change their ways. That should be our intention, not just for people to be punished. Psalm 6, 1 to 4. O Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my poems are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver me, save me for your mercy's sake. So it just keeps saying, you know, we're weak. We don't always do the right things. Have mercy on us. If we're asking for that for ourselves, then we should have that towards other people. And then the last one on this subject, Psalm 145, 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all and all his works. We're glad that God is understanding towards us and we need to be understanding towards other people. Okay, so after all this pleading from Moses, let's keep reading and see what God does. This is verse 23. So the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the congregation and say, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation and he said, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tent of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives and their sons and their children. And Moses said, By this you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all of these works, for I've done nothing of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they're visited by the common fate of men, then God hasn't sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens up its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you'll understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Now it came to pass, as Moses finished saying these words, that the ground split apart underneath these men. 
And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and all the men with Korah and all of their goods. And so they and all those with them went down alive to the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And then a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. So God consented to only kill the, the leaders and he instructed everybody else to get away from them. The people were showing their faith and their allegiance and their obedience to Moses and to the Lord by moving away and disassociating them, themselves from the rebellious people. And so that's a lesson for us too. When we're made aware of our mistakes and our misplaced allegiance towards someone else, then we need to disassociate ourselves from that person or thing that's taken us away from the Lord. Now, Moses wanted there to be no doubt about the choice that God had made. And so he wanted everybody to see that God had placed him as their leader. He hadn't done it himself. And so Moses asked that God reveal his choice in a supernatural way so that nobody could say it was a coincidence or not of God. And then Moses also told the people ahead of time, uh, what was going to happen so that there would be no doubt they would think there was no coincidence. This was God's choice. And so God created a sinkhole where the three rebels were standing and the earth swallowed these men and buried them alive in just a moment. And then fire came from the Lord and burned not only in the incense of the 250 men, but it consumed them also. So basically the incense that they had in their censers caught fire and burned them up. So let's read the rest of this passage and see why God burned the people that were holding the censers. This is verse 36. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for these censers are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against their own souls, let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. Because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy, and they should be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented, and they were hammered out as a covering on the altar. To be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who isn't a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. So the reason that these people were burned up when they burned the incense is because only the priests were supposed to be burning the incense. And these men wanted Aaron's job. They wanted to be able to burn the incense like all the rest of the priests, which Aaron was. And so they thought that God would approve of them if they did this. They were basically saying, you know, we believe that you're not any more special than we are and we should be able to do the same things as you do. And so basically God said, all right, you think you can do their job? Do it. Take the incense and burn it and see if I accept you in doing the same things that I accept them to do. See if you are as holy as them as you claim. And then God revealed his choice by killing those that weren't supposed to be using it. And so then he said, you know, the people that were using these censors were not holy, but the censors still are holy. They are part of my holy things. And so he told Eleazar to gather all of the censors and hammer them into a sheet of bronze and then place that sheet over the altar so that everyone else would see it as a warning and remember that only the priests are allowed to serve it. Only the priests were chosen and God made it clear that day. And so that's all that we have to talk about today. 
the greatest thing that we can learn from this is to recognize our own gifts. That God wants us to do something with them and to do it well and work with others as they perform their task so that together we will all accomplish his will on earth. Now, if you don't happen to know your gift or purpose, then pray and ask God to reveal it to you. There's also questionnaires that you can find online that'll help you, guide you through some questions and help you discover what your spiritual gifts might be. And then once you know your gift, ask God, what does he want you to do with it? How can you work with others to accomplish his purposes here on this earth? Look for opportunities to use your gifts and then leave room for others to use theirs also. Oftentimes in churches, something needs to be done and so we just do it even though it's not really what we're gifted in. And sometimes leadership just begs for this thing to be done. And so someone steps up, even though it's not their area that they're gifted in. And I think both of these scenarios are not good for the church. If it's a true need, God is going to raise somebody up to do it. But if you go ahead and do it, even though it's not your gift, then the person that God wants to do it may never step up. That position may need to be vacant for a little bit to encourage other people to step up and do what God is calling them to do inside the church. And it may be that you need to step outside of the church and find someone, and that won't happen if you don't give time for people within your own church to do it. And so ask God what he has for you, and then leave the positions to other people that are gifted for that. When I was the children's director, it was very clear there were certain things that I was not good at. And so I always told people, you know, I can't do everything. If I do, I'm not going to do a good job at it. And so we need you to step up and do the things that you're good at, but only the things that you're good at. And if every single person steps up and does the things that they're good at, then the church will flourish. And so that's what we need is just everybody to step up and do the things that they are good at and leave everything else to other people. Someone will step up to do it if it's important. God will continue to 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 weigh it on their heart until they do step up. That also happened to me whenever I became the children's director. They kept looking for people and looking for people and nobody was the right fit and nobody was the right fit. And every week I kept thinking, you know, I kind of want to do that, and I think I would be good at it in some respects, but other respects, I think, that's not for me. You know, I'm not a decorator. I can't do all of those things at VBS and, you know, all of these different things. And it took people in the church coming to me saying, hey, you know, would you want to do this for me to say, well, I do, but there are certain things that I don't feel equipped to do. And they said, no problem. We don't expect you to be able to do everything. We just need you to facilitate it. And so if you could be the person that does a lot of the stuff and then find other people that are good at it to do those things, that's all we're asking. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, I can do that. Definitely. And so that's whenever I stepped up. But I had to find people that were good at decorating. And we had so many people that were great at that in our church. And it worked smoothly because everybody performed their role. And so do that. Step up to the things that you feel like God is calling you to do. And then let other people do their role. I think that's what we can learn from this today. Don't be like Cora and those other people that he that joined him and try to usurp someone in their role that God has given them. Just be happy with the gifts that God has given you and do it well, work well with other people. So next week, we're going to see how the people respond to God's choice in Moses and Aaron. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that episode. If you're new to Live Through Jesus, make sure you go to livethroughjesus.com and enter your email for your free five-week Bible study. Thanks, and have a good day.